Hi, I'm Gabriel Reves. I grew up in Northern Quebec, and really, that's where my passion for the outdoors came from. Most days, I'd be gone out in the wilderness before my parents would even get up, and um, that's really how I learned about what was surrounding us. But this also taught me what could happen if industries were prioritized over the environment. When I moved to the Yukon, I realized how pristine the wilderness is up here, and it really inspired me to do anything I can to help protect it. I think there's no better time to do this trip and document it the right way to show the world how special this area is. So I contacted a bunch of friends from around the world um, to convince them to come on this trip. <laughs> and um, it worked out really well. But I did need to promise Scotty's parents that I was going to bring him back home safely. <laughs> so my name's Scott Sinton. Uh, I'm from Auckland, New Zealand. It was my first time in the Northern Hemisphere, and it was my first time in a canoe. I had this vision of me flipping and being stuck and drowning and Gabe going, oh, that shouldn't have happened. The trip is roughly 1,500 kilometers long. We're covering six rivers. Two of the major challenges are going to be portaging Aberdeen Canyon, where we have to carry all our gear around, and the Rat, which is 130 kilometers upriver against the flow. It's awesome to have the chance to bring them into that area, especially because it's under threat. I live in Dawson City, where I've been mining with my family for the last nine years. I think we get labeled as the bad guys, but I do care about the environment, and honestly, I can't wait to get up there and explore the north. So um, I brought my 10-month-old puppy on the trip, Zephyr. He's a little wire-haired pointer. Basically, that's why I have a dog, so that, they, so that um, she can come with me on adventures. And I'm just super happy to be out for a walk. I can really cheer you up and um, help you move forward. And uh, we just brought all our gear on the dock, and now we're flying to Elliott Lake, and they'll leave us behind, and we'll be by ourselves for two months. So it'll be the biggest relief to finally be out there and just enjoy. Once you're on the plane and you're literally flying into the bush, that's when it kind of sinks in that you're about to go do what, what you've said you're going to do. There's no going back now. People were just giddy, and except for Didi, he was actually sleeping. I couldn't believe that. Je sais pas, je suis quelqu'un qui adore le plein air. C'était quelque chose de nouveau. C'était quelque chose de gros. Puis c'est juste quelque chose qui qui passe une fois dans une vie. C'est pour ça que j'ai décidé de faire partie de l'aventure. <laughs> what excites me about this trip is the unknown. You can only take so much gear, you can only plan so much. So whatever you don't have, you just have to adapt to it. We 
things on. It's happening. So the planes are off now. And um, gosh, the trip that I've been thinking about for two years and preparing for the last year has finally started for real. I was like, this is a different world. Like bald eagles and all that sort of thing. My first day paddling on a river ever, I saw my first moose, so that was pretty cool. Just seeing that sort of thing in the wild was, yeah, pretty phenomenal. The dogs bring a very interesting dynamic, even if sometimes they'll piss you off. It's still an amazing distraction in a way that it's always a happy dog. I think it's pretty awesome to have them with us. Well, the group dynamic was interesting because I was the only one in the whole team that knew everyone else. People were checking one another out. I think it was the perfect mix of old and new friends. There were some new stories to hear, but if stuff went wrong, no one held a grudge. Yes! Okay, one, two, three. No! Oh! <laughs> so where are we heading, boys? We're on the high river, and we're heading to a canyon with no name. Apparently it's pretty rad. Woo! We definitely want to stay here, because it's just too beautiful. And hopefully tomorrow morning we get a bright blue sky and get better shots with this amazing background. The Pier Watershed is definitely a very unique ecosystem. Um, being so far up north makes it very fragile. But there's lots of mineral resources in the area and this is pushing the government to open it up for development. But First Nation groups and its environmentalists are fighting for its protection. So we hiked up this mountain in the Hart River, and when we got up to the top, the view was insane. <laughs> I remember thinking that I wanted to have a picture of me with that view in the background. Something to remind me of that feeling I felt, freedom. <laughs> Pretty good, I think. It's like skinny dipping, kind of. <laughs> <laughs>
you reckon over there? Because on that down, but it looks like there's a rock right there. Yeah, I think it's a piece of cake. Teeter tottering on each other tired and we were joking, it was pretty funny. But the problem was we lost to our boat speed. So we approached the next one and we were sort of side on trying to get right. Oh. Yeah. Is a hole in the boat? You reckon? Yeah. You reckon a hole? Yeah, for sure. And obviously a crash can spell the end of it potentially. Simon est allé vérifier en avant pour voir s'il y avait des dommages. Puis là, il a dit, we gotta get to the shore. It's water, isn't it? Water coming out. That's bad. It's the kind of thing that usually would just need to leave it like 24 hours in the sun type of thing, but it's, it's not gonna happen now. That was a good wake up call. These things, even if they look easy, there is always an aspect of risk. In the rapid sections, I knew I was the one that had the most experience, and I was very, very confident. What annoyed me was that we hadn't checked the last rapid. We hadn't walked down, and Gabe had said, no, this is safe. No, we had no idea of the line to follow. So it was just the last minute. OK, you had a chance of it's just Je sais pas, je considère ça comme un accident. Made a quick fix here because we want to keep going, we don't want to have to stay here. So we just basically put a layer of glue to seal the crack and then we covered it with duct tape. The leadership role in general, it was definitely not always easy because, I mean, we're a bunch of friends. We're all adults, right? And so, and especially the friend part, I didn't want to be annoying at telling people what to do or what to not do. I think Gabe realised that he had made a mistake as well. So that was a good lesson to be learned and we didn't have to pay a price for it. Gabe and I had experience on another canoe trip of hooking in canoe but not catching them. Uh, so it was one of those like fish that got away and we're going along the peel and I noticed a whole lot of fish breaching. We have to find out what fly to use to catch them. But they're huge. I'm so nervous I can barely tie my flies. I'm almost scared to catch one. The start was super frustrating. Like, I probably went through 20 different flies trying to hook these fish. And... I've never seen so much fish and we can't catch them. Gabe was the first one to hook one. And this fish wasn't even close to getting in the net. Booyah! Cheers. First thing to do. And we ended up landing four of them and we filleted them all. One was so big that I was really keen on making a smoker. I put a whole lot of willows together, we uh, cooked it up overnight, and it was the next morning delicious. Mm. Uh, well, we've unloaded the canoes and we're gonna uh, carry gear uh, piece by piece uh, on our backs. What a relief to finally be here. And I've passed all those rapids, which were one of the biggest stress for me for the trip, so for the team, so that's good. Now we just take our time and walk the trail. It's going to be hard, but I think it's going to be fun to just do something as in paddling. Yeah, start. Use the legs a bit, which we've been sitting down for a lot, so we'll see how we feel later on tonight. At the moment, amping for it. The first uh, kilometer was great. Uh, feeling good, you're fresh. I definitely overloaded myself. I love my life right now. <laughs> so 
How are you feeling, God? Pretty good, actually. Dogs are just loving it. They're like, hey, we have to go for a walk. We were pretty high spirited. Uh, it's not gonna be that bad. And it was so obvious after the first trip that that was completely wrong. The good terrain quickly turned to swamp. The hardest thing about it is that you're always going back on the same trail. Like you, you know how hard it is and how ugly it is. And you're like, oh yeah, we have to do this again twice. Aberdeen was like going to war. It was mentally and physically probably one of the hardest things I've done in my life. We tested a few techniques, me and Gabe. It took us four or five minutes to do 50 metres, maybe 100 metres. And I don't know about Gabe, but I was buggered. And I was like, we can't do that for 4K. And we both knew it. It got stressful for me as well because I was wondering if some people would lose it. Uh, Didi got really frustrated and I started being scared that it was because of me or whatever. Puis je me dis ça finira jamais. Tellement plus aucune énergie. Puis t'es tellement à bout, c'est juste c'est pas le fun. Knee deep in swamp, surrounded by mosquitoes. But I was struggling. I was getting pissed off at myself for being slow and I was physically was hurting. I just turned laughing and to the point where I just was laughing at what situation I was in. It was such a relief when I got to the end. I just started running. At that point in time, we were just like, that we never have to do again. Um, all that effort that you put into it, you get it back right when you finish. Yeah, dude. You know, I found it necessary to break out a 15-year-old bottle of scotch. Tasting that, and it, it was a, the indicator that one of the hard parts of the trip was done. Right now we're leaving Aberdeen Canyon, which is very satisfying. Um, we all can't wait to get back on the water, so let's get going. We just conquered Aberdeen, and it's like you get this gift, this canyon, which not many people get to see. There's no, no outside influence of sounds. It's always really quiet, beautiful. What I didn't expect was the drastic scenery changes how different one spot was to the next. Looking around and seeing how beautiful this area is, really makes me think about the whole debate that's going on. Mostly everything we used to get out here on this trip comes from the mining industry. Our canoes are made of plastic, the fuel, our gear, our clothes. We need mining. But after seeing an area like this, I definitely think that some places should be left alone. So this was all going around in my head when we came across this First Nations fish camp. I assumed First Nations in an area like that would be very closed off. This guy came up and he introduced himself. We were welcomed with some coffee and um, big smiles. It was the first family we've seen, the first other people we've seen in a few weeks. A really unique window, which not many people get to see. And as soon as I met them and we started talking, I thought, you know, this whole protect the peel, this is who it affects. I got to chat to Stephen and ask him a few questions about the way he lives, his family, the future, um, what, it, what his concerns are and things like that. And After I finished with high school, I came back to our community and I continued to live here. Our 
Dad always said that he wanted smoke coming from this camp all the time to see smoke coming from the chimney. And so this river is very important in terms of providing for my family. It was very up to date with development, different preservation, ecotourism, like he knew very well how to work the land and live off the land. Talking to Roberta, she I could tell she was really sort of sizing us up and she wanted to see what kind of people we were and the the food that we eat here, it's right they eat right from the land. I remember long ago when in the springtime when the ducks used to come back, there was millions, I may as well say, like, you know, and now you hardly see them. The only concern that I think we'd have wouldn't be for filling in the rivers, but for the, any kind of contamination or pollution that there might be. And with development, I think there usually always is. Um, the people in Northwest Territories are complaining about um, cancer and all kinds of sicknesses. They can't even drink the water anymore, and we don't want that up here. In the 50s, 60s and 70s, I believe it was, there was a lot of oil exploration in this area. And there's a lake that we always go to hunt caribou. And in the past, I've seen like 40 barrels which were full and just left there. And then they want to come in here and develop some more when they can't even obligate themselves to come and clean up the mess that they've left already. Um, I'm Canadian and um, all the acts that surround the mining industry are Canadian. The land that they're mining, it's crown land. And we all depend on that economy. And I'm far from being against mining. But I think it can be done in a better way. And I definitely think that we need to preserve some areas. And um, if the people that live there and that have been living there for thousands of years don't want it, um, I think we should listen. We've already lost quite a bit of our culture and our tradition and whatever remains depends on the land and the wildlife that sustains us. But already, they already signed the papers and whatever, saying that they are going to come up here. It's so maddening that I want to cry. <laughs> they should come out here and live out here, even stay out here for a week and see how we live, and then talk about destroying this land. We really connected with them, and I think that was the first time as a filmmaker that I kind of went, OK, because I'd really gone into the film just wanting to show the boys and the adventure side. I was aware of the issues, but I couldn't relate to them yet. Perfect. I think we're going to use that one on TV. And that was the first time I really put a face to what we were there to do. Well, this is the first time I've probably met people that live in this way. <laughs> And I think it's amazing. Um, so I'm jealous in that sense. And did you definitely notice a group dynamic shift after that, that? To really feel the group bond with them. And you could see them get passionate about showing people why it's so important to protect not only the physical land, but also their way of life. Meeting them, listening to their stories of how they grew up there and knowing that it can be taken away gave our whole trip more of a purpose. Especially me, it definitely made me question some things. So we're on the Husky Channel, and we got to paddle 30 kilometers upriver against the flow, and then line 100 kilometers to till we get to Summit Lake. <laughs> this is the ride. Let's do this. And we're going backwards now. Pretty much as soon as we started, it just started bucketing with rain. I had to keep paddling, otherwise I was going to probably get hypothermic. My fingers were frozen, my thumb, I could barely feel. I was so frustrated. I was cold, I was wet, I was tired, I was hungry. You know, like, four of the five buttons were being pressed all at the same time. 
it was nine hours and we ended up getting to camp at like three in the morning, but because of the 24 hour daylight, we could still see. It was from far the worst weather we've had on the trip so far. Soaking wet for five hours or so. And yeah, pretty cold. Good night. <laughs> I woke up in the morning, I went to go for a piss outside, and I turned around, and the river was flooded. It was a shitty situation. I mean, the river rose two meters in five hours. Ran over to check the canoes, and unfortunately, we had lost a couple of paddles. We were all pretty shocked about it, um, and now we have to deal with the flood with only one spare paddle. We all really wanted to go forward, and very quickly, I realized that it wasn't a good decision. There was huge spruce trees floating down the river, but we're in it. We weren't really fully aware how dangerous it was. We probably should have stopped a bit earlier, but it was tricky because we didn't know what was facing us, and, and we had to go check it out to see, and so we probably should have done four kilometers instead of six. They're gonna try and um, ferry across, but um, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Um, I think it's gonna be pretty hard to manage to get there and then to be able to continue on with our day. And the river keeps going up. We were in the middle on this island and we have to get from one side to the other. Even if we were floating down the rat, it would have been dangerous but we were trying to go up it. I mean, it wasn't safe at all. It was pretty scary. If we started going backwards, it was dangerous. So you have no option but just paddle as hard as you can until you reach the other side. It was a good place where we had a good complicity on just what to do, when. Since the river got high, there's, it's washing away the riverbank, and trees are falling over, creating sweepers. So Didi and I were trying to go along a section which had a series of sweepers. Didi had his paddle staking out. Uh, as the sweeper worked back from me, it caught his paddle and sent it off. He jumped out and started running back. I chased after him and. We searched, we went right back to basically as far as we could and couldn't find it. There's no way finding a paddle in there. And the water is way too murky. It's going up, man. There's massive trees that go across and stuff. We had to still ferry across to where the other guys were. My tears a stick, which didn't work, and no, it just that was not a good situation. That's the moment I sensed that there was no joking, there was nothing I could say, like he was at his end. And uh, the river is still going higher. Now we've got no spare paddle. And I've heard people say this before, but we were literally up shit creek without a paddle. I was parti dans le bois, j'aurais pris tout ce que j'aurais pu casser, puis je l'aurais fait. Puis la seule chose qui m'a retenu, c'est la petite voix intérieure qui me dit, ouais, t'es pas mal loin. De tout, si tu te blesses en, en essayant de casser des choses qui ne serviront à rien. T'as bien fait de ranger ta caméra aussitôt que je l'ai dit parce que il fallait pas que je me rende à la caméra, je pense. And Gabe called it right then and there. We're stopping. This is it. It's too dangerous. We had a couple days off, and we decided to make some proper food. It's really important to have because we're burning tons of calories, and I really felt like having some pizza. 
no matter how bad you're feeling, having a good hot meal just can really pick up your spirits. The flood left us with zero spare paddles, and we just had to, worst case scenario, we'll cover on paddle. Well, I've grown tired of singing songs that I don't believe in anymore. And I've grown tired of feeling old. Like I'm looking for summer, but I find the cool air. In those two days, we had a really, really rough looking paddle that weighed, I don't know, probably 20 pounds. It was insane. Hell yeah. But, you know, you could use it, worst case scenario. When my seasons roll by high and low, I don't hold the reins, I ain't got control. And I wish my days had a different role. And I wish my path were a ragged bone, yeah. Let's leave to Lining up the rat, I was always at the front it's really awkward because you're having to keep quite a high pace and it's, you feel like you're just stumbling. That you're basically dancing around, trying to step on one boulder and you slip off and then you try to correct yourself and you step on another boulder. It's like doing lunges for 10 hours a day. And you've got Gabe telling you that you need to look back more and you're like, bloody hell, I'm trying to just not fall over here. In some parts of the trip, I definitely felt like Scotty was about to lose it. By 7K mark, I was in serious pain, and I learned later that it was my hip flexor. Gabe had no sympathy for me, so I just, we just had to keep going. We had 10 times that amount to do over the next 10 days. So we couldn't wait for his injury to get better. I definitely wanted that expedition to keep going. I pushed through a couple of walls to get to the 8K mark, and that last 2K made Aberdeen seem like a walk in the park for me. I was just at my wit's end. At that point, I just said, guys, I, I have to stop. I can't even walk. We didn't know how it would go with him injured. We had to go up. It became very, very stressful for me. Felt like crap because I wanted to achieve the rat under my own steam. So every step that Gabe did without me felt like I was losing that sense of accomplishment. Eventually, Scotty could walk along the banks. So we had to split two canoes amongst three people. Even just walking on the shore, not pushing a boat, was extremely hard. I was worried that it wasn't going to heal without having a full lay day. But luckily, because I took it really easily, it did heal. And as the rats started getting easier, we started getting to the top, I was able to start lining again and helping. So we just did 17 kilometers today, up river lining, and set a goal to make it to here, and we made it. Yeah, Holy shnikes. Set. <laughs> <laughs> you got it still? Yeah, yeah. The last 40 Ks of the rat was beautiful. But then we got stuck in the shitty creek. We were stuck in that little creek for the whole day. It was cool in a way, because we knew that once we'd get out, it'd be unreal, but you can still never imagine what it's like. You know, I've seen ditches that are bigger than that. It was a real mission because obviously the water's coming down, which essentially pushes the vegetation uh, to face downstream. So you're trying to plow through the vegetation, but these spikes are just catching every piece of rope, every spray skirt. All you can do is just grab a tree and pull yourself forward. Um, it started clearing up. The flow started slowing down towards the end. It was almost just teasing because I knew the lake was so close that it felt like that last little bit took forever. And the relief that came to me when I saw that lake, I thought earlier about screaming when I saw it, but I didn't because I wanted the other boys to experience that same feeling. Just go in the middle and just hit record and then just spin. <laughs> the ultimate challenge of the trip, so 
That's a big, big, big relief to be up here. To be up here. 200 meters, couple more quarters. It was also the end of the stress for me because all the rapids were done. Going up the rap was done. Crossing Aberdeen was done. It was so beautiful. It's really, really hard to explain it. I'm never going to forget the rap. We came in and we have a, a beach in front of us, beautiful reflection, all mountains around us. But at that level, you couldn't do it justice. My idea was to keep going higher until I got the view I wanted and Scotty to come with me. I was pretty content getting some nice shots from camp because camp was just beautiful. But then I had bloody Simon on my case. Pretty much telling me to F off and he had his shot already and was happy. Gabe had already started cooking. It was such a relief to be up at that leg, which marks our halfway point. This would lead us into the Yukon watershed. <laughs> yeah, it'd be like playing canoe. Oh, yeah, fuck yeah. that was funny. <laughs> funny. Oh, okay, yeah. Man. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was still sitting working on Scotty. I knew I could convince him. But I was still like, oh. I don't want to do this, Simon. It was like 3 in the morning. Hiked up this hill, and I was feeling really tired. And we also had to factor some sleep into that, so. We knew the sun was coming up at 5.30. And I remember setting the alarm, and I was like, damn it, we'd better wake up. End up having, like, probably 40 minutes of sleep. The alarm starts going. And I punch Scotty and wake up Scotty. I was dead. I didn't want to wake up. And as soon as I put my head out of the tent, it was, like, probably the best sunrise we'd had of the trip, and I just went. You sort of walk up to a valley here, and then it went to a viewpoint. So you're kind of hidden from the view until right at the last minute. When you got to that pinnacle, the view was just like, just panorama, just insane. So at that point, I kind of went, I went, wow. And then I went, OK, Simon, this is pretty cool. Yee-hoo! Probably the most beautiful thing I've seen in my life. The beauty with like a time lapse is you set it up and hit start and it just clicks away, you don't have to do anything and um, you just get to kind of enjoy the moment. So for me, I think I, I'd had a pretty tough 10 days. I think I was more relieved than everyone. that one, I was there, but two, I could share it with someone. Yeah. And it's downhill, bro. Let's do it. Let's go get breakfast. Yeah. Head out across the lake. Yeah, just take a moment and have a little me time. I get onto the very far side. And I saw a big kind of stack of um, caribou antlers. And as I got closer, I realized that there was actually an army ammunition box. So I opened it up and it was the Summit Lake guest book. Some of the oldest entries were from 1962. So that was pretty incredible to see their stories and some of the other epic journeys that people have been on. It'd be nice to stay a couple of days. We gotta keep moving and never know what the next bend will bring. Wow, the creek coming out of Summit Lake is a little too narrow and has a ton of willows going all over the creek. You can't even see the water from the top of it. And if they don't believe us, and if they don't believe us, we sing a little loud. Went to the little bell. It was a little steep, a little tricky. We swamped our boat, but the other boats we managed to do good. I 
been to mountains before, but to paddle through them in glassy, calm water with the sun, and it was just like this combination of everything. When we were paddling for hours on end, I would think a lot. I would think about our trip. I would think about my family we met along the way, about my future, and what I'm going to do with my life. I felt completely comfortable being out there. Towards the end, I could have stayed doing that for another month. Every comfort I needed, I had. I'm actually doing a challenge. Basically, I just have to not tip the canoe going down this little slope. I think he can, but I, but I still think it's going to be funny whether he gets it or not. So. Right on the border of Canada and America. Nice. Intense customs around here. Yeah. When are we getting checked? <laughs> we'll see. Hopefully, we don't get checked. <laughs> the whole trip, actually, we've been joking around about putting a sail up, and we tried a couple of times and had no luck. They're trying to rig a sail, but as soon as they got the top out, it became a headwind. Today, we decided to actually rig up a proper sail. We've got a pretty intense uh, tailwind, that we, and yesterday we didn't capitalize on it. We're going to have the 17-foot canoe in the middle with the sail, um, and two uh, 18s as outriggers. We're going to have uh, steering capabilities and able to raise and lower the sail, so we're hoping for the best. Oh, uh, I don't think it'll work, but there's so much to try. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're sailing. <laughs> sure beats paddling. <laughs> We did over 60 k's today, which is one of our biggest days on the river. I think our top speed was just under 16 kilometers an hour. So we're hoping the tailwinds will continue and we've got the Yukon Flats coming up. So the more wind, the better, as long as it's behind us. So as we got closer to the Yukon River, we could feel the seasons changing. It got a lot colder and started getting dark at night. It was awesome to see the stars again and seeing the northern lights for the first time just blew my mind. The Yukon River was a lot different to the Peel. We started seeing a lot of boats, people, buildings, and the water quality dropped dramatically. Even though we were careful, half of us got sick. Last couple of weeks went so quick, and before I knew it, it was our last day. It was pretty surreal. It was super cloudy and misty. It was like the weather knew. You're still just paddling along, and 
you know, so it slowly kind of appears off in the distance. We start remembering everything that's kind of happened before that to get to that spot. And I know I took a moment to look around at each individual person that I was with. That like, moment with those people was so awesome. <laughs> this is the end. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We still had the race. Simon said to the Frenchies, oh, so shall we do this? Shall we race? Let's settle this. And you could tell like, they were super cocky going into it. My heart was beating, my heart was racing because I was like, I wanted to beat them so bad. So they beat us out of the blocks, but we straight away got in front of them. When I say in front, it was neck and neck, like going, boosting side by side and our boats rocking back and forth because everyone's going so hard. And I knew we had to do a change. I knew we had to do it early because you lose so much boat speed. So we do the countdown. And Scotty misses his change. I saw the French just kind of surge forward and I went, shit. We just hammered it down. Simon was, he was just like, he could see that I was getting pretty tired. And he was like, just go, go, go. And I can see out of the corner of my eye, those two right there. <laughs> and they beat us from like a couple feet. <laughs> and it was hard as hell. I'm happy for Simon and Scotty that they won it. We nailed that one, the one that mattered. We bloody won. So, Team New Zealand. <laughs> We're just arriving to the bridge, the Dalton Highway Bridge, north of Fairbanks in Alaska on the Yukon River. And um, this means that we've gone through about 1,500 kilometers. Feels good to be here, but also definitely been sad, I've it's, it's been a pretty cool trip. Personally, I was never sick of the river. Like, there was no point in the trip ever that I felt in my mind that, that I would rather be somewhere else. To see that bridge meant that I was going to be back to the normal civilization. I didn't know if I was happy or not. We're just paddling straight at the gravel bar and we just hit it and like, at that point we were all such good mates. It was it was a really it was really yeah, special. Boys. It was for me like it was it was, a, it was a big achievement, like definitely ah. the hardest thing I've done. We did it. And most rewarding thing I've done in my life for sure. Aussi unique, ben, c'est quelque chose à voir. Uh, yeah, strange. We're packing up, ready to end the trip. Gabriel studied up here, and um, I study in New Zealand, and his knowledge is so focused on this area. So on this trip, I've learned a lot, and you see how huge it is, but you don't realize how fragile and how quickly it can be destroyed. I had a lot of respect for Steven and his family, you know. I really wish that they can stay there forever, along with all the other families. And I will mine around Dawson, you know, but I will never, I would never mine in the Peel. Our trip is all about listening to what the people are saying they live there and have done so for thousands of years. This is what they know, this is what they believe, and they're the ones sharing it with us. And now we're able to share it with them, uh, an even bigger audience. Now I'm gonna do the degree in conservation biology and keep working towards that way and working into tourism a little bit as well, because I think guiding in tourism is one of the best possible ways of sending your message out there. It's a major, major lack in our culture right now. We're getting so far away from nature. And if more people could get out and check it out, it would make such a big difference. Heading north to find my way home Find my way back to where we've all come from Past the busy streets and the only things I've known Heading out into the great unknown 
I will pack my bags with little more than what it takes to keep me warm and the knowledge of what's gone before my time. I think it is very important that this country be left as pristine as possible so that, you know, in the future we can have people come here to experience a totally wild environment. That's not for money. No, it's worth more than money. It's life for my generation, for my children and their children to continue. I know it's for the rest of humanity to see and the rest of the world to acknowledge that there are places within this world that are worth fighting for.